Okay, I think it's starting. Yes. Okay, so should I start? Yes, Luis, you can start. Okay, bon dia a tots. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you much. Uh, thank you so much for being here. This webinar is entitled Cooperation in the Arctic per Perspectives from the EU, Finland and Portugal. Uh, the Arctic region, as you know, is a source of many conflicting interests inside and outside of the EU. This region is divided between eight nations. It is where four million people live and it is a crucial area where climate change is studied as regards to its impact. Scientific advancement, energy extraction, and economic possibilities are vast in this region, but they must also be handled with the utmost attention towards the climate and the dangers of global warming. Debates such as this one are necessary. I now give the floor to the Ambassador of Portugal in Finland. Thank you. Okay, Luis, I, I will take the floor now. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uvo uh, Womenta. And welcome to this webinar on cooperation in the Arctic uh, with perspectives from the EU, Finland, and Portugal. I would like, like to start by thank you, thanking uh, the three keynote speakers for making this webinar possible. Uh, we are all looking forward to hearing your interventions. Uh, that will follow my short welcoming remarks. Uh, Michael Mann, the EU Special Envoy for the Attic Matters from the European External Action Service. Uh, thank you for your presence. You will be presenting the recently approved new European Union policy for the Arctic. Petteri Vorimaki, Ambassador for Arctic and Antarctic uh, Affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, of Finland, will address Finland's views on Arctic cooperation. And Professor, uh, Professor João Canario, Portuguese National Council member of the International Arctic Science Committee and Vice Chair of the IASC Terrestrial, Terrestrial uh, Working Group will give us an overview of Portugal's position regarding the Arctic in the context of current European policy on the topic. Uh, and having this last uh, reference in mind, you may well ask why is Portugal uh, a, nation, a nation far from the Arctic interest in what is happening there. Allow me to share some ideas with you on this. Uh, as you know, the Arctic is a region that is facing a multitude of challenges, as Luis Sergento just mentioned, most notably the many impacts of climate change. And everything that happens in the Arctic affects the rest of the world, Portugal and the European Union included. The rising sea levels, the new transpolar mar maritime routes that are being developed through the Arctic region, the new natural resources available with a permafrost thaw that can be discovered and studied. Possibly one fourth of gas and oil world reserves could be found there, as well as new minerals worth more than 30 trillion US dollars. Even the new geopolitical balance in the region with the growing interest of powers like the USA, Russia, Canada, or China, uh, all this can have important impacts throughout the Euro European Union and in Portugal. Having all this in mind, it is important to follow closely what is happening in the region and to be ready to make the best decisions uh, when needed. For that purpose, purpose, Portugal is currently developing an action framework <coughs> for the Arctic, as we, will, uh, as we will do not have a formal strategy for this region yet. We are already a member of the International Arctic Science Committee and Professor João Canario is our representative there. We, uh, and we were very engaged in the scientific research in the region. We are very engaged. Uh, we also organized the last Arctic Science Summit week, uh, and all this shows our interest and capacity in this area. We are not currently observers at the Arctic Council, but this is a possibility being studied, studied at the highest levels in Portugal. As you can see, there are good reasons for Portugal to be also interested in the Arctic region. Taking all this, and this into account, as well as the recently presented joint communication of the European Commission on, the, uh, on a stronger EU engagement for peaceful, sustainable and prosperous Arctic, we decided to take this opportunity to discuss with you the current <laughs> positions of the European Union, Finland as our host <laughs> here, and Portugal on this critical important matter. 
I thank you all again for uh, your presence and wish you a fruitful and interesting discussion that I'm sure it will be. Kitos Palian, thank you very much. Muito obrigado. Thank you. Yeah, so, Professor Michael Mann, uh, please, uh, you have 15 minutes to make your presentation, and then it would be Petteri Vorimaki, and then Professor Jean Canario. So, uh, Dr. Michael Mann, please start. Thanks very much indeed, Deluis, and thanks very much, Francisco, for uh, organizing this event uh, and asking me to speak. And I, I must say, it's, uh, it's especially good to see a, a non Arctic member state such as Portugal taking a Project of interest in Arctic matters, um, and it's good to hear all of your plans that you have coming up for the for the near future and on uh, your involvement in the Arctic. Uh, as you said, two weeks ago, the uh, Commission and the High Representative approved the EU's updated Arctic policy. The paper, as you said, is entitled "A Stronger EU Engagement for a Peaceful, Sustainable, and Prosperous Arctic." It's the latest update to our Arctic policy, following previous versions in 2008. 2012 and 2016 and the updated policy is the result of a year and a half of consultation discussion and outreach to interested parties in the eu and also well beyond the new document is we believe an ambitious blueprint for our work in and on the arctic for the coming years now in the uh, eu jargon which i will try to avoid uh, but it is called a joint communication from the High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy and the Commission. This reflects the fact that for the EU, the Arctic is about both internal EU policy and foreign policy. The Arctic has changed dramatically in recent decades and especially quickly in the five years since our last policy paper was released. We in the EU are committed to upholding a safe, stable, sustainable and prosperous Arctic, which must remain a region of low tension and peaceful multilateral cooperation. The first point to make is that the EU is in the Arctic, so we have strategic and day-to-day -day interests, both in the European Arctic and the broader Arctic region. It's a cliche, but it's true. What happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. Likewise, the climate crisis the Arctic is facing is not caused by the activities of around 4 million Arctic inhabitants, but by the actions of the 7.8 billion people who live south of the Arctic Circle. In fact, the Arctic is warming three times faster than the global average. Geopolitical interest in Arctic matters has grown hugely over recent years. New players, including China, are increasingly active, attracted by easier access to resources and to transport routes. Russia, too, is looking to increase the exploitation of oil and gas and encourage shipping through the Northern Sea Route. As the ice melts, Russia's Arctic coastline becomes more exposed. So these factors, combined with global strategic considerations, have influenced a recent increase in Russian military activity. The US and its allies and NATO have responded with exercises of their own. The major geopolitical and economic player the EU must react to these challenges and bring its Arctic policy into line with its political priorities, not least the EU Green Deal. In short, EU engagement in the Arctic is a necessity. We recognize that the eight Arctic states have the primary responsibility for what happens on their sovereign territory. Yet many of the challenges the Arctic faces can best be tackled through regional or international cooperation. This is especially true of climate change, which brings with it new safety and security challenges. Going forward, the EU will seek to mainstream Arctic matters in our diplomacy and enhance our work in Arctic regional fora. We maintain our application for observer status in the Arctic Council, which is opposed by Russia following the imposition of EU sanctions linked to Crimea and Ukraine. Despite this, we will continue to work productively with Russia in the Arctic context, not least on environmental issues under the Northern Dimension Policy Framework, and of course, in line with our five principles. We are also able to engage strongly in the Arctic Council under a 2013 agreement, giving us the same de facto rights as full observers. In the future, 
it will be important for us to work together with all our Arctic partners in Europe, with the US and Canada, and with other players involved in Arctic affairs. We hope, of course, that non-Arctic EU states will continue to take a greater interest in what happens in the High North, which is very well illustrated by this morning's event. It genuinely matters to all of us. Such international cooperation is vital to keep the Arctic a region of peaceful cooperation. Now turning uh, a little bit to the detail of our new uh, Arctic policy that was released a couple of weeks ago, I think it's fair to say that two of our proposals won the most attention in the media. Firstly, our push for oil, gas and coal to stay in the ground and to work with partners towards a multilateral legal obligation not to allow any further hydrocarbon reserve development in the Arctic or contiguous reasons, regions nor to purchase such hydrocarbons if they are produced. Secondly, our plan to establish a European Commission office in Nuuk, Greenland. But of course, for the real aficionados of Arctic policy, there is much more to our new document than these two headlines. The European Green Deal is at the heart of the EU's Arctic engagement, together with the recent Fit for 55 package, our biodiversity policy, and the EU's approach for a sustainable blue economy. All this supported by science, innovation, and regional investment. We will act against major sources of pollution affecting the Arctic regions, in the air, on land, and at sea. Things such as plastics, marine litter, black carbon, chemicals, as well as transport emissions, and unsustainable exploitation of natural resources. We will contribute actively to the implementation of the agreement to prevent unregulated high seas fisheries in the Central Arctic Ocean. And we will support marine protection in the Arctic by pushing for the establishment of marine protected areas. One of the biggest challenges the Arctic region faces is the thawing of permafrost. Vast amounts of crucial infrastructure are built on permafrost, and this is becoming unstable as temperatures increase. We saw last summer in Russia the collapse of a, a diesel tank in Norilsk, which caused massive amounts of pollution. And that I think is the possible sign of things to come. The thaw of permafrost also releases huge volumes of methane, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas. Through our new policy framework, we will therefore promote research and cooperation on the effects of thawing permafrost. We will also promote sustainable solutions in the European Arctic for extracting minerals, which are critical for the green transition, notably the setting of high standards with our global partners for reducing the environmental and social impact of mining and processing. We will use our research budget and expertise in Earth as observation to better understand and counter the effects of climate change. We want to stimulate a green transition so that Arctic regions can showcase future compatible job creation in sectors including green energy and sustainable approaches to connectivity, tourism and innovation. Our Arctic policy must also put people first. We will invest in people and sustainable jobs, increase the involvement of the young, of women and indigenous peoples in Arctic decision making. The first time in our Arctic policy we make a direct reference to the principle of free, prior and informed consent before taking decisions with an effect on indigenous peoples. We will use funding available from several programmes, for instance Horizon Europe, our regional funds and our connectivity and space programmes to create opportunities for innovative companies. Over the last seven years, the EU has funded around 250 million euros of Arctic research. And I'm very glad we're going to have one of the practitioners with us this morning. And that's under the Horizon 2020 programme, notably on climate change, biodiversity and sustainable development. This commitment will certainly continue under Horizon Europe. Northern Sweden and Finland received in total around a billion euros of each EU regional funding in the same period. So as you can see, there is already a very solid base on which we can build. I hope I've given you an insight this morning into our approach to the Arctic 
um, you will find our 16-page document on the website of the EAS and the Commission, and I'll try and send the link now on the chat function as well. I think and I hope that it's a relatively readable document, so I'd recommend you to take a look. I'll stop now as I'd much rather listen to other people and have a discussion with you about any issues which you might like to raise with me. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Michael Mann. Um, so I would give the floor now to Petter Ivori uh, After that would be Professor Jean Canario, and after all these presentations we would have a Q&A. So, uh, Dr. Petteri Worimaki, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. I'm experiencing, uh, I see Michael nodding, thanks very much. Some technical problems. We are infested with these technical problems in this virtual era, and I do hope this virtual era to stop as soon as possible <laughs> and we get back to real, uh, normal um, human meetings. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank Mr. Ambassador Francisco for the invitation um, and for the initiative uh, for this webinar. I think this is a, a, a great idea. This is a good example of the cooperation and interaction between uh, an Arctic state, a member of the Arctic um, Council, and um, uh, an interested actor, which in this case also a a partner in the in the European Union. This is a type of interaction that I have been calling for um, um, in the discussions in the Arctic Council with our observers and beyond, um, because I think this interaction and this kind of cooperation is important um, and it is uh, beneficial uh, for um, um, all. Um, Francisco highlighted the Portuguese interests on um, on, on the Arctic. Um, I, I think it's it's sort of clear uh, why Portugal is interested. We have a very strong uh, scientific base. The Arctic cooperation. There's a there's a strong component on on marine issues. You're a um, a big marine uh, nation. You have experience to to share. And the fact of the matter is that the, the Arctic um, um, the, it has risen on the international agenda and it's attracting more and more uh, attention um, around the world. So I very much welcome um, the Portuguese um, uh, interest um, and I continue to extend my hand uh, here in Helsinki and with regard to Lisbon um, for any way I can be of assistance in further facilitating this, um, this this cooperation. And I also checked that also in the Antarctic, which is the other half of my professional identity, that uh, Portugal has been a non-consultative member on the in the Antarctic Treaty from 2010 onwards, and a member of the Committee of Environmental Protection from uh, 2014 onwards. So there's also scope and room for um, our cooperation on the on the Antarctic um, uh, file, and I, I mentioned the Antarctic because I am the I'm the only I'm the first Finnish Arctic ambassador who has given the portfolio of 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 handling also the Antarctic, and that is immensely fascinating um, and important um, combination. The regions are vastly different in terms of history and and law. Uh, geography, uh, but there are also common themes re related to biodiversity and the melting of the ice, uh, protection of the of, of the environment. Um, and the fact remains that both of the polar regions and the developments therein remain crucial for the whole of Europe and for the whole of um, um, world. Um, and this is the point that I keep ma making also here domestically. I appeared late last night in a TV uh, talk show on the Arctic, um, and I mentioned the Antarctic. This morning, um, I was at the morning TV on the Arctic, and I referred to the Antarctic. Um, it sometimes comes as a surprise, but then when I make the point that there are five countries in the world who are at the same time permanent members of the Arctic Council, and permanent members of the Antarctic Treaty. Um, it becomes evident why I'm making the point, and these countries are Finland, 
Sweden, Norway, the United States and Russian Federation. And that opens a whole new um, uh, perspective on how we approach the wider um, polar uh, issues. And um, the last point on the Antarctic, let me just note um, that Finland will host the annual uh, meeting of the treaty partners, the Antarctic uh, Treaty Consultative Meeting in the spring of 2023. So uh, in May of, of 23, um, I will have the pleasure of chairing a two-week meeting which gathers um, several hundreds of Antarctic colleagues around the world to, um, uh, to Helsinki. Now on the, the, the Arctic, um, Finland is obviously one of the eight um, Arctic countries in the world. We're one of the eight um, permanent members of the, of the Arctic Council. The Arctic Council has um, also risen um, in terms of its relative importance um, um, globally. Um, and I think one good example, one practical example uh, of that is that we have 38 observers uh, currently, both states and organizations. Um, several have already applied uh, and uh, several have uh, flagged to me or, or elsewhere their interest in, in considering uh, applying to become an observer and I, I took a uh, very careful note of the Portuguese uh, intentions um, in, in that regard. The, the Arctic Coast Council is and, and, and will remain a preeminent format for a circumpolar Arctic uh, cooperation. And that's important to underline because the, the Arctic region is not a monolith. There are basic three different Arctic realities. There is the North American Arctic, there is the, the Nordic um, Arctic, and then there is the, the, the Arctic of the Russian Federation. And if one looks at the world map, the, the geographical region covered by the Arctic Council is enormous. Um, and the point that I made this morning uh, in, in our national TV or was it yesterday, um, is that it, it, is, it is very um, reassuring and positive to note that despite the problems that the European Union or the West at large um, has experienced with the Russian Federation over the last um, uh, years, the Arctic context has offered a, a context and a platform where that constructive cooperation has still prevailed um, and we're currently in the third month or fourth month of the Russian two-year presidency or chairmanship of the of the Arctic uh, Council and I'm confident that, that 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 sort of positive and constructive spirit of cooperation will prevail also during this chairmanship um, and, uh, and and beyond the the Russian chairmanship program is, is extremely ambitious um, um, and, and they have mapped out an enormous amount of, of, of meetings, um, not all necessarily related to the Arctic Council, but are Arctic related one way or the other. So we will have an extremely busy two years um, um, ahead of us. And I think um, the fact that the constructive cooperation prevails in the Arctic is important, of course, for the Arctic, because the Arctic is important for all of us here in the Arctic. And it is important for everyone uh, uh, in Europe and uh, in, in the world uh, for many different uh, reasons. Um, it has almost become a platitude to say that what, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. But that is a fact. Um, and um, if we do not manage to, to, to stop and control and mitigate and adapt to the accelerating climate change, in the Arctic and in the Antarctic, then uh, we will be in an extremely dire situation elsewhere um, in, in the world. There is no point in beating around the bush. Um, we have a serious situation um, in our hands uh, in that regard. But also beyond the Arctic, I think the constructed cooperation is important in the sense that it could offer an example. It could 
it, it could have a spillover effect on other more troubled regions if the uh, if and when the the cooperation between um, Russia and its other Arctic partners uh, prevails that offers an example that co constructive cooperation um, is um, uh, possible um, moving on uh, domestically then to our national Arctic policy uh, strategy uh, that took us about um, I think in a year and a half uh, the pandemic slowed us down a, a, a bit um, but then eventually in June of this year we were able to release the strategy um, the process was uh, steered by the, the the Prime Minister's office um, all, all ministries took part um, um, and, and we had rather thorough consultation process with, with all the national um, uh, stakeholders um, and um, we presented then the strategy to the diplomatic representations accredited to Helsinki in September um, um, I believe it uh, was and I had the pleasure of um, uh, speaking on that occasion together with the, the uh, Prime Minister State Secretary and the Secretary General of our Arctic uh, Advisory Board. Um, it's a good strategy. Uh, I think it's more focused, uh, it's more concrete than its um, uh, predecessors. Um, the novelty, I think, um, is, is twofold. One is that the international affairs or international issues or the world outside Finland was not made a separate priority and that was a conscious decision that was made at the very beginning of the um, of the process it was put in the introduction so that it overarches everything that then follows in the strategy the thinking and the logic being that nothing that we do here we do in vacuum we do that in active interaction either in the context of the European Union or bilaterally with our partner countries um, or in the regional uh, or rather sub-regional um, uh, setting be it the Nordic Council of Ministers or or the, the Barron Zero Arctic Council and the Northern Dimension Policy Framework that Michael already um, referred to and, and, and other uh, relevant um, um, entities and, 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 and organizations. Um, I suppose the other novelty on that was that uh, we included a, a brief but still a section on the Antarctic um, and um, the, the introduction is is drafted in a sense which underlines the fact that we consider ourselves to be a polar um, country with keen interest obviously we're interested in the Arctic because we are in the Arctic and the strategy defines the whole of Finland as Arctic so in actual fact, as I'm sitting here, or rather standing in my office here at the Foreign Ministry in Helsinki, I am in the Arctic uh, currently by our um, uh, definition. Um, but it also makes reference to our Antarctic um, uh, objectives. Um, the strategy also uh, makes very clear um, how big of a uh, priority the climate change, um, environment um, uh, and, and, and biodiversity um, are and underlines the, the, the very importance of, of, uh, of, of pressing, stopping, um, mitigating and controlling these um, um, adverse processes and their um, uh, impact. It secondly focuses on the um, in, inhabitants um, because the, the, the point that I have been making on hundreds of times is to defy the perception prevailing uh, in certain parts as if the Arctic region was an unregulated wilderness inhabited by polar bears without any rules or regulations. Actually the contrary is the case. This is well regulated uh, inhabited um, um, region. And the second part of the inhabitants of course are the indigenous peoples um, that reside in the Arctic region. In the case of Finland, the, the, the Sami people, uh, in the case of Russia and North America, um, uh, several um, uh, others. The, the indigenous people are of particular, or if I reverse the point, saying that the Arctic Council is unique internationally in a sense that the 
uh, indigenous peoples organizations, they sit with us, with me and my colleagues at the Senior Arctic Officials Format. They sit with the ministers when the uh, ministers meet every, every two years as equal partners, as equal participants um, in our deliberations. And that, 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 that's unique and that, that's very, very important. Um, and, and we must ensure, and thank you to Michael for um, uh, referring to that and including uh, clear stipulations in the EU's communication. Um, we have to ensure that their rights, uh, their culture and their livelihoods are, remain protected in a situation where, where half of the world is turning their eyes on the Arctic, uh, some for science, um, some for climate change, and some for the business of opportunities. Um, and they have thousands of years of, of, of history behind them, and they possess valuable traditional knowledge on, on how to cope with climate change. And um, that offers a useful addition to, to sort of traditional science that um, um, we are able to, to, to gather. So uh, we have to keep uh, keep respecting their their their, their rights. Um, then the third element in the strategy is the, the the Finnish polar expertise, our expertise on on, on cold uh, technology, um, or, or our research capacity on, on the cutting edge research on on various matters um, pertaining to life um, and living. Um, in cold regions and in addressing um, uh, climate change. Um, and then lastly, the um, infrastructure and uh, logistics. Um, that was our domestic um, Arctic policy strategy. We're now entering the stage where the concrete implementation of the strategy um, uh, will begin. Um, and, and I finish with reference to the joint uh, EU's joint communication on um, on, on the Arctic, for which I'm extremely grateful, um, and uh, I know the, the very, very hard work that Michael, uh, together with his uh, colleagues, uh, together with the Commission, uh, put into the preparations of the communication uh, over the past um, uh, year and a half. Um, I, I think it's it, it, it's well written, uh, it is uh, ambitious, um, uh, and, and it contains several things which which are and where and shall be important um, uh, for Finland. Um, obviously, there are some elements therein which merit further uh, reflection, um, and that is then the institutions have their prerogative of putting forward their communication, and then the council has their prerogative then on pronouncing the common view by the EU member states. Uh, so I look forward to also working together with Lisbon and, and New Francisco here in Helsinki um, when the council then starts the process um, in, in responding and uh, taking obsession to to, uh, to various um, um, issues in the communication. But um, I, I think it's, it, it is a very, very good um, communication. I congratulate the, the authors and, and congratulate in particular Michael uh, for his hard work. Um, what we have repeated um, time and time again is that in our view, uh, seen from here, uh, we want more EU in the Arctic, and we want more Arctic in the EU. Uh, it's in the EU self-interest to give more priority to the Arctic, not because of Finland or Sweden or the Kingdom of Denmark, but because of Europe itself and because of the European Union itself. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you, Dr. Petteri Vorimaki. Uh, now, Dr. Jean Canario, the floor is yours, please. Thank you and good morning uh, again. Um, well, it, it is a, a challenge to talk about uh, Portuguese policy for the Arctic because uh, for being Portugal and not, and not uh, a non-Arctic country, our cooperation or our strategy is basically through science. And uh, that's what I'm going to talk here right now. Um, well, Portuguese has a long history in the Arctic. Uh, we could not, we cannot forget that in the 15th century, uh, João Vasco de Real was the, in the coasts of Newfoundland. And this is quite important for, for, uh, for uh, the, the national achievements in terms of discoveries, not only the India and the, the, the east part, the east and the west part of the, 
of the the world that the, our navigators travel in the in the 15th century but also in the arctic and the, uh, according to the to the history he, he was one of the first uh, portuguese explorers in, in the arctic and so far we have been present in the arctic mainly because of, of fishing and uh, as you know the cod fish is a national dish and you can also only find the cod fish in the Arctic. So for many centuries, Portuguese navigation in the Arctic has become has become quite common. But as I said in the beginning, the, the Portuguese uh, strategy for the Arctic is, of course, based on, on science. Because as I mentioned, we are not an Arctic an Arctic country, and this is uh, for now our uh, the possibility of our contribution to, to this issue. And we have been increasing, uh, particularly since the last International Polar Year, the, our presence, our science presence in the Arctic. Uh, this has began, as I mentioned, in the, in the last Polar Year, but uh, since 2010, we have been increasing our presence in the Arctic, both in cooperation with colleagues from the Arctic countries and also involved in the international organizations like the International Arctic Science Committee of the Forum of the Forum of Arctic Research Operations. And uh, based, all, uh, based also on these organizations and in cooperation with the, with the colleagues from all over the, the, the Arctic, we have been increasing our research in, uh, in all the Arctic. Uh, we've been doing research on atmospheric science, marine science, environmental science, uh, biological science, and uh, this has been a pan-Arctic uh, research perspective for the country. In terms of, of our strategy, our, uh, let me say, our uh, science strategy, our our this strategy is uh, basically found based on five uh, five pillars let me say like this one is climate change in arctic environmental protection the other is sustainable development in the arctic and in surrounding areas international cooperation indigenous people's rights and traditional knowledge and impact in lower latitudes and so i will talk briefly about each one of these topics because this is what we are in Portugal now focus on. In terms of climate change in, in Arctic environmental protection, we have been conducting research with partners in uh, climate change research matters, impact of our climate change in Arctic ecosystems, and also environmental protection of our Arctic ecosystems. And we have been doing some real nice works with our colleagues, for instance, on the role of land surface in climate projections, projections on permafrost store of contaminant release, natural contaminant release from uh, glaciers melt and also from permafrost straw work. We have been doing some work on biodiversity, ecology or in green, greenhouse gases releases. And we have been also working not only with colleagues, but with the indigenous peoples on processes or uh, emerging problems in the Arctic, like coastal erosion, mitigation and remediation, particularly related with pollution, marine fishing, but uh, uh, terrain degradation, Arctic greening. And we have been using the, not using, but have been uh, um, used as the base, the Sustainable Goals, United Nations Sustainable Goals, to work with uh, with our colleagues and also with our uh, with our partners, because we believe that Arctic science should engage and empower indigenous populations, and also that because Arctic we believe that Arctic science should improve sustainable use of resources and promote the well-being of populations. In terms of international cooperation, as I mentioned, we have been doing uh, work, scientific work with all arctic countries including including russia but not also, not only with arctic countries but with also with other european countries and this is, has been a great process of uh, cooperation of change of knowledge and uh, a better way for the portuguese researchers to be aware and to be integrated in, in the arctic research 
As I mentioned before, we are now uh, part of uh, for, uh, three big uh, Arctic, not Arctic, some of our Arctic and not more general organization, international organizations like the European Polar Board, the uh, Forum of Arctic Research Operations and the International Arctic Science Committee. But since the, since the second Arctic Science Ministerial, the, the government of Portugal and particularly the Ministry of Science has give to the scientific community, uh, the scientific, the national scientific uh, community, uh, a strong, um, a strong uh, encouragement for us to be part of this Arctic Science Ministerial and also to um, give, uh, to provide to the International uh, Scientific Arctic Committee uh, a good uh, feedback about what they have been doing in the Arctic and about what can be our contribution. In terms of, uh, again, in Arctic Science Ministerial, we have been signed mostly with our partner in Spain, some memorandum of understandings for cooperation, for Iberian cooperation in the Arctic and also with uh, in joint venture with our Arctic colleagues. But yes, this has not been only focus on this international organization because we have been leading some uh, particular, we have been having some important role in, in it also in the international organizations. For instance, the, there is a Portuguese researcher that is vice, vice president of the International Permafrost, Permafrost Organization. We have been doing an important role in the EU Polar Net uh, uh, initiative. And uh, it, it is, this is quite interesting because international, the International Arctic Science Committee uh, present, uh, invite a Portuguese, Portuguese uh, researchers to be delegate at the Arctic Monitoring uh, and Assessment Program of uh, AMAP, and also on SAWAN Sustainable Arctic Observation Networks. And this is for us and for Portugal, a, a, a big um, recognition about the work we have been doing, we have been doing in the Arctic. And of course, we have been also being part of many uh, European Union projects like the, the Nunatar Yuk, which is a coastal erosion process related with permafrost thaw. Since 2017, uh, uh, we, Portugal, have been sharing an international uh, program, an IASC international program called Team Mosaic, Terrestrial Multidisciplinary Distributed Observatories for the Study of Arctic Connections. This program is a pan-Arctic program that intends to uh, understand the, the influence of, the, of the, the melting of sea ice on the terrestrial ecosystems. And there have been a, a, a program that is complemented, have been complementing with the, the mosaic expedition and has been uh, sharing, as I mentioned, from Portugal and also from Canada. And actually, that's one reason I'm here now in Canada. And this project has been uh, uh, involved uh, in several uh, Arctic initiatives and has been, uh, has been found with cooperation with many Arctic and non-Arctic countries. Actually, this project will end by the end of this year and we are now starting to think about the continuation of this project because there is many interest about the T Mosaic 2.0 that uh, would extend our goals, our scientific goals to the next uh, four, four years. And actually this will be in discussion next year at the Arctic Science Summit Week in Tromsø in Norway. This program, T Mosaic, have also been quite um, important for Portugal, we since we have been having the uh, strong involvement of our Ministry of Science and also from the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology, which is the national uh, foundation for that provides funds for scientific research here in Portugal. Another a pillar of our strategy of Arctic strategy, and this has been uh, has been having been a, a learning process. Is that is the indigenous peoples' rights and uh, traditional knowledge. 
one of the things that we have been learning is that scientific research in the Arctic should uh, should be also uh, focus on indigenous peoples, their needs and their concerns. This, in, in terms of our policy, we believe that the, our research should have or should have taken into account the indigenous rights, the respect for knowledge right holders, the research towards indigenous needs, indigenous engagement on research, implementation of science, citizen science protocols, strong involvement of stakeholders, and permanent contact with local authorities, including academia. And we, uh, since the last three years, we have been doing a, a large, uh, an a large and important work with uh, the involvement of indigenous com communities, particularly here in Canada, and the communities from the from the eastern Arctic, eastern Canadian Arctic to western Canadian Arctic, and. Uh, this work has been doing uh, by uh, involving the, 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 the indigenous, indigenous communities in our research and also providing citizen science protocols to uh, schools, to high school, uh, high, uh, students, high school students and uh, to provide them these tools to help us on, on the research and to increase their interest in science. Finally, we are quite quite uh, engaged in the study of the impact in lower uh, latitudes. Someone said before me, sorry, I, I, cannot, I cannot remember who, that what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. And this is true. And we are, since we are uh, a middle Atlantic, uh, middle latitude Atlantic community, this is quite important for us. Portugal is strong, uh, strongly involved in the pole to pole perspective. Also, uh, in, in, in line with European Union All Atlantic policy. We have a Portuguese agency called the Atlantic Interaction Research Centers that intends to work on the, all the Atlantic from the Arctic to the Antarctic. This uh, Air Center, uh, as I mentioned, is uh, presently uh, with talks with many Atlantic, uh, many Atlantic nations. I know that for the last three or two weeks, there was also meetings with the Finland government for their involvement in the Air Center. And one of the, the, the main goals of the Air Centers of the Air Center is this pole-to-pole -pole perspective. So uh, the, what they are trying to develop is a, 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 an observation system that will cover all, all the Atlantic. And this observation system will involve a space component with satellites an atmospheric component with balloons and uh, other other uh, other types of equipments, but also a sea surface component and an underwater component. Component. See, uh, this is quite important for us because we in Portugal and also in mid latitude countries have been experienced the consequences of the of the climate change impact, not only in the Arctic, but also in the Antarctic, but mainly in the Arctic. And so this pole to pole perspective, which is, as I mentioned, uh, being studied by the Air Center, is a key role in our Arctic policy. So uh, as a final remarks, uh, Portugal has a, recent, uh, uh, has a recent polar research program, but with relevant uh, outputs at international level. Portugal, as a non-Arctic country, believes that international cooperation is key to address the impact of climate change in the Arctic and to better investigate in, in mitigation, adaptation and remediation measurements. Portugal has been sharing international Arctic programs and as well as scientific association dedicated to the Arctic research, a recognition of the Portuguese Arctic research. Portugal, as a mid latitude Portugal, as a mid-latitude country, is fully committed with a pole-to-pole -pole strategy. The Atlantic expertise and tradition will contribute to a better understanding of the global impacts of climate change. And that's all. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, thank you very much uh, for everyone. Um, I would uh, post now uh, three questions. Um, I would post one question and then everybody can give their individual answer. 
uh, and then after that maybe you would have questions to other speakers uh, uh, so let's start with my question um, this my question is a bit uh, academic uh, in the sense that it talks about uh, integration theories and European integration theories uh, the main schools of European integration were uh, neo-functionalism whose main theorist was Ernst Haas intergovernmentalism made famous due to Stanley Hoffman, uh, St Stanley Hoffman and Andrew Moravczyk, and more contemporary theories such as constructivism, distributive bargaining theory, and rational choice theory. Taking these theories into consideration, which institution has been the most influential in the development of the EU's Arctic policy? Is it the European Commission that has shown itself as a creator of consensus as and as an integration maker or are the individual member states and their individual governments the ones that are mainly responsible for the development of arctic policy and european integration as a whole please state your opinion yeah, so maybe uh, for example uh, dr michael mann yeah thanks for a very interesting question i it's, it's a difficult one to answer i mean as I said in my speech, I think, you know, the, the Arctic states have the primary responsibility for what happens in the Arctic. Um, but there are things that can only be sorted out, you know, together. So I think, um, you know, clearly the, the Finns, Swedes and the Kingdom of Denmark have the, have the sort of first say. But I mean, when we're talking about the challenges that are facing the Arctic now, they can only really be dealt with internationally. So I think it's good that the EU takes a role. Uh, and that, you know, perhaps we can include in our policy some things that some of the member states couldn't include in theirs, or, you know, sort of try and add value. I mean, that's that's what the European Union tries to do. It tries to add value to what uh, is being done on a national level. Um, in terms of the institutions within the European setup, I mean, clearly, um, you know, I work for the External Action Service, so I, I work for the sort of foreign policy, geopolitical side of the story, and I think it's true to say that this joint communication now in 2021 is the first one that's really uh, had a geopolitical aspect to it and sort of already sort of very sort of openly geopolitical aspect to it but the but if you like the main meat of the communication is is things that fall under the competence of the commission and the thing about doing a policy on the arctic from the institutional side in brussels is that we have to be very careful that in the areas where we have competence, we make sure we're using them, but that we don't overstep our competences and put people off. Um, so that's a very important factor. Clearly, um, also the European Parliament has played a very big role in this. Um, they were, I think, the instigators of, a, of an initial report many, many years before I started this job. And I suspect that, unfortunately, at the time, the premise that they started with, as, as Petri mentioned in his speech, about the very big difference between the Antarctic and the Arctic, I think they started on a bad premise and perhaps got the EU off on a, on a bad footing. But if you remember, if you, if you look at the recent parliamentary report on the Arctic, certainly the Parliament has done an extremely thorough job and is very much on the same lines as, as we are. And then, you know, the, the member states, of course, within the European Union, and we, we will hopefully get endorsement from the Council uh, early next year on our communication. Petri said that certain issues might need to be discussed, and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that, and I think I, I, think I know what he's talking about. Um, but, um, you know, we, we were able to do this update of the Arctic policy because the council under the chairmanship of Finland, uh, and I look to my friend in, Hel in Helsinki uh, with big thanks, uh, persuaded the council to adopt some conclusions which um, started the whole process. So I've given a very broad answer and not a definitive answer, but hopefully that was illustrative at least. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, would you like to say something? I noticed that you raised your hand. Uh, yes, I just, I just, uh, just before uh, Petteri answers, because I, I know that he has something to say, maybe I can uh, ask Petteri to be a little bit more detailed when he mentioned that, uh, maybe it will be interest for us, that there are some things in, in, the, in the commission uh, communication that member states should uh, have an opinion to say, and uh, uh, maybe uh, Petteri could uh, tell us a little bit more about the Finnish position regarding that. He mentioned that there are very positive things in, in the communication, but, but other, that, uh, other things that could be uh, better viewed or uh, more discussed 
if he can uh, also in his answer about this say something about that would be nice then then i will ask another question afterwards thank you very much um th th thanks very much uh three quick points um in um as regards the integration theories um, 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 uh, um, how the integration theories goes, and if my recollection of the IR theories is correct, neo-functionalism is probably the correct answer with its spillover effect that I referred to also in the Arctic uh, context. The second point, I uh, have spent a good part of my 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 earthly existence um, in the institution so i'm careful enough when the institutional prerogatives um, are uh, raised it's like sticking your head into a lion's den um, but i i i honestly believe that um, when when finland has been pushing for the eu's stronger arctic um, policy and uh, raising the, the Arctic higher on the EU's vast list of priorities. This is not because of Finland, but it, it is because of Europe as a whole. And I, I firmly believe that the institutions have the prerogative and, um, and, and they have the, the obligation that when they put forward their text, that they, um, I'm very, thankful to Michael and his colleagues that they have talked to us, kept us informed, uh, listened to our views, um, considered many of our views. But at the end of the day, their obligation is to look at the Europe as a whole, um, Europe's place in a wider uh, um, uh, scheme, uh, scheme of things. So this is not something that we we push because of, of of pure national interest i mean obviously we're not an innocent bystander being in the arctic but i think the issues at stake um are larger than that to, to francisco's question i um uh, no i can't I, I i don't want to really for two reasons one is that the communication came out only i think a week and a half ago if, if i remember correctly um it's still being read here um uh there are still decisions that are needed here there are, there are a number of ministries in 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 involved and um um i have made everybody aware of what i think and i i, I still i shall stand behind with what i think um but i don't want to prejudge the the decisions that will collectively will be made here and the second point of course here is that um i think we're in a public uh, webinar, it probably would be inappropriate in advance to disclose um, any position that the member state would take in the confidential council debates that will then in due course uh, follow. Sorry, I couldn't answer the question and I hope I, I managed to wiggle, wiggle myself out of it. I was being provocative, sorry, myself. <laughs> Uh, Professor uh, Jean Canari, would you like to add some comments uh, regarding the first question? Uh, yeah, it's for for me as a scientist. It's also it's always quite difficult to to give to to have a, an opinion uh, or a clear opinion on this on this uh, European Union versus national national initiatives for for the Arctic. I, I think that. Uh, the Arctic, the Arctic countries should have a major role on, on, on the process because they are living there. And so uh, they are the primary, let me say, the primary, let me say like this, the primary stakeholders of this process. Although I think also that um, there is a broader perspective about what's happening in the Arctic. And so I think that the, the, the European Union sh should have uh, an important uh, an important role also also on this process. I was quite happy about uh, about when I when I received the the, the the European strategy for for the Arctic, and I was really happy because some of the European Union, let me say, concerns are also a part of the national concerns. But in terms of the policy for the Arctic, I think this should be in terms of my country. This should have more. Uh, should be more directly uh, worked th 
through the national diplomacy, diplomacy, and not as not as us as as research, Arctic researchers. Okay, so let's move on to my second question. I believe uh, Dr. Michael Mann approached it a little bit, but it's still a, a valid question. Um, being the European Parliament, the EU institution that is directly elected by the EU citizens, what can this institution do to be able to surpass the noticeable path dependency that is visible in many of the EU's common policies and also in this specific Arctic policy area? Uh, in other words, uh, what can the European Parliament do to surpass path dependency in Arctic policy? Um, I'll jump in quickly there. Um, the, the, the Arctic policy of the European Union is a very complicated beast, actually. I mean, you have, as I said before, certain areas of 100% uh, com community competence, other areas where we simply don't have any competence at all. And, and of course, if you look at, um, if you look at the, um, the environmental legislation that actually applies in five of the eight Arctic states, because it also applies to Norway and, and Iceland because of their membership of the e European Economic Area, I mean, this is something where the European Parliament has, you know, co-decision making powers. There are there are areas, um, fisheries management, for example, um, m management of natural resources uh, and marine resources, where the Commission has very strong um, competence to to manage the stocks on behalf of the of the 27. So it's a mixed picture, really. I mean, the European Parliament, through its engagement, they, they, there was a delegation from the Foreign Affairs Committee in Greenland and Iceland recently. They're, they're, they're doing a very useful job in raising the profile of Arctic matters in the European Union. Uh, and they, through their report, have given us a push as well. Um, but, you know, they, they do already have co-decision powers on a number of areas that are directly applicable to the Arctic and, you know, don't on others. But that's a little bit of a reflection on, on the sort of legis legislative, uh, sort of the EU competence question more broadly. So I think they're, they're sort of, I would just say that they are using their, their leverage to the full extent possible, to be honest, and, and we're very grateful for it. So if you looked at the debate around the recent report in the parliament, there was a very great, there were 400 amendments, I believe. So people are taking an interest and, uh, you know, part of my job is to try and increase uh, awareness within the European institutions of Arctic matters. So, you know, anything that can help in that direction is much appreciated. Yeah, Dr. Petteri Vorimaki, would you like to add a comment? Well, comment, I, I wish I could answer. I mean, um, I'm, I'm not trying to avoid answering questions, but I'm, I'm been around long enough to, to know when I need to uh, display caution. The, the, the first element uh, is, of course, the interpretation of the treaty provisions, um, and I, I wouldn't want to venture uh, into that field i leave that to the institutions um, and secondly um, i mean if there's one thing that i've, I've learned in, in, in international and domestic diplomacy is one should never um, venture into instructing or expressing an opinion on what the parliamentarians should or or, or should um, not do um, i think that's a that's a very risky um, having, so I, I try not to comment on, on what, the, what the Honourable Members of the European Parliament may or may not uh, wish to do. I'll leave that to their discretion within the applicable treaty provision. You can see that Petri is a far more uh, able diplomat than I am. So. Uh... <laughs> uh, Ambassador, would you like to say something? You have raised your hand. Uh, Ambassador, we cannot hear you. I think you have your uh, microphone off. Yes, I'm sorry. Now I have. I, I just was saying that I will not touch this this topic because I think the two previous speakers already said what should be said. But um, I, I would like only to, I think we are coming to the end of our time, but just before we finish, I just want to ask or to comment that one of the, the things that all the three key note speakers mentioned was that 
uh, it is clear that what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay only in the Arctic. And that's also one of the reasons why Portugal is uh, involved uh, and interested in, in being involved in this, uh, in this, uh, in what happens there in all the areas, especially now in the scientific and research uh, area, as uh, Professor João Canario uh, clearly mentioned. And it's, it is amazing the, the work that we are doing and how involved we are uh, in the perspective of the polar to polar um, strategy. As also Peter Gorimaki said, it's an important one. But uh, it is clear also that in this in this, uh, in what matters to this, uh, what is happening in the Arctic, it is what uh, Ambassador Borimaki said that the cooperation spirit prevails, and it's very clear, for instance, in the in the in the Arctic Council that it happens with all member states and observers cooperating with each other, and even if the EU is not a member. An observer, uh, it is uh, it is clear that uh, cooperation still prevails, and maybe I will do uh, I will I will pose a provocative question again, but maybe not. Uh, what what do you think uh, that having in mind this cooperation uh, spirit will be uh, the answer for the requests of? Uh, uh, of European Union to become an observer that is still on the table for uh, some years. Uh, do you think this uh, cooperation spirit will help to uh, solve and get, get, get have an answer for this uh, for this request that is more than uh, logic and fair, uh, but is still not uh, an agreement on that? What do you think? Thank you very much, and I, I I use this opportunity to thank you for your presence here today and. To, to be with us and share with us your, your ideas. Thank you very much. Who would you like to start? Myself or Petri? Petri, perhaps you're your best qualified for this, I guess. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I certainly hope so. I, I wouldn't completely overrule it. Um, what I've been saying that is, is that the more that the European Union um, and its um, commission services are able to demonstrate their their sort of active engagement and contribution to the work of the Arctic Council, its working groups, and the projects therein. I think this will go a long way in then demonstrating the value of, of also formalizing the EU's uh, observer um, uh, status. So my answer is I, I do hope so. Uh, just just to add briefly to Petri there, I mean, clearly, as I set out in my opening words, um, it's, you know, an inconvenience, but uh, we are fortunate that thus far we've been able to uh, participate um, in, a, in a similar way to official observers. But if you look at our new Arctic policy document, we do make the point there that we are going to try and commit to an even greater extent to uh, some of the work of the working groups and the expert groups. Uh, we also talk, for example, about the One Arctic, One Health project, which is run by one of the working groups of the Arctic Council, which is something that I think it's fair to say Finland is very much taking the lead in. So our intention is to continue to uh, be engaged in that and, and hopefully to a greater extent. Uh, and we hope that in the fullness of time, um, the, the way is seen to give us the, the observer status that we think uh, we would like to have. Uh, doctor, your microphone is off. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry. Um, as I mentioned before, I think cooperation is base is basic for 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 uh, development of Arctic research and development of Arctic policy development of uh, what I said before because uh, about the mitigation remediation of, about what what's happening in the Arctic and for an Arctic country like Portugal, this is key. This is key, and uh, that's why I think, and I've been uh, I've been asked several times by our Ministry of Science about our opinion about uh, our opinion 
on the Portuguese being part of the Arctic Council, um, if this would give a good contribution to the Arctic science. And I, I've been saying yes, always yes, but of course this is not, uh, this is not on the dependence of me as a researcher or, of, or the Ministry of Science. But for us, this cooperation is, is key for not only for our country uh, Arctic policy, but for the Arctic, I think, let me say like this, for the Arctic, for the Arctic as a whole. And so, uh, yeah, that's what I think about this. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, would you like to conclude, Ambassador? I think I, I, I already said it, what I uh, wanted to say, but I think I, I repeat it again. Thank you very much for all your presence here. I think it was uh, uh, a, a very interesting uh, talk. We had people from uh, the European Union, from Finland and from Portugal. And uh, uh, I think we can say that we are all in the same boat. Uh, defending uh, the Arctic and uh, uh, being uh, part of this, uh, being interested part, interested part of this, I think we are all uh, involved and should and continue to be like that. But uh, there's a, a way ahead now with the discussion of the EU uh, policy uh, just presented. Uh, I think there will be some very interesting months ahead of us. Um, I, I'm, I'm also very happy to to listen to, I was very happy to listen to the presentation of uh, Professor João Canari and to see how involved we are, Portugal are, and that there is also some contacts between Portugal and Finland on this area regarding the, the, the air, uh, the air center in, the air observation center in the Atlantic and uh, I hope this can go ahead and be uh, one step more in our bilateral relation also in the Arctic. Thank you very much for your uh, presence here today. Thank you. Thanks very much for inviting me, it's been great. Uh, Thanks very much. Thank you. I look forward to much more Portuguese involvement in the future. So thanks thank very much. you. And I look forward to continuing good cooperation here in Helsinki with Francisco. Great work. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye-bye.